So hello to everyone. I have the pleasure today to welcome Dr. Chiara Roba from Genova. Hi, Chiara. Hi, Fabio. Um, so Chiara Roba is a worldwide expert in many fields, but in particular in uh, brain and brain injury. But the topic today will focus a little more on the brain dysfunction in RDS patients and whether the monitoring of the brain in these patients can, could give us some additional information on how to manage. This patient. So the first question for you, Chiara, is, uh, is brain dysfunction uh, frequent in RDS patients? Thank you, Fabio, and thank you all for uh, listening to us today. Uh, well, unfortunately, brain dysfunction is very common after ERDS. Uh, there are uh, reports uh, and studies we, which report an incidence of uh, up to 60% of patients who, after ERDS, then maintain or develop uh, cognitive dysfunction or delirium or neurocognitive alterations. And this is an important number considering the fact that the ERDS has already a high mortality and morbidity. And plus on this, uh, on the top of this, you have to add the number of patients who are not able to go back to their normal life because of neurological dysfunction. So it's, it's very common and probably Fabio very much underestimated. Just for our listeners, so we always think that, uh, you know, a lung disease is a lung disease located into the lung. How, which would be the pathophysiology? If you want to say a few words on how a lung injury could influence the brain function in these patients. So um, the organs in our body talk to each other and uh, there is not never uh, one or only organ dysfunction because there is always a crosstalk. And one of the most important and studied crosstalk is the one between the lung and the, the brain. So if you have a patient with isolated traumatic brain injury, for example, he will develop for sure a higher number of respiratory complications compared uh, to patients who do not have a, a brain injury. On the other hand, if you have a lung injury, you can have, you can develop several, through several mechanisms, uh, a high number of uh, uh, neurological issues. The mechanisms are several. Uh, it could be related to a local, which then becomes systemic inflammation, which is associated with the infection itself in the lung. And sometimes it is also associated with, uh, uh, with a lung injury that we create through the mechanical ventilation. If we are not very good at ventilating the patients, if, if we don't protect the lung, at the same time, we don't protect the brain. And it's also related to the fact that some strategies that we use to protect the lung and to ventilate the patients are good for the lung, but are probably not perfect for the brain. And this is the difficulties because sometimes brain and lung go into different directions. And when you have a concomitance of uh, injuries in both organs, it's very difficult from the clinical point of view to know where to go. Okay. Can you tell us whether, you know, now it's COVID is of course a uh, uh, very hot topic. Is RDS COVID different in terms of brain dysfunction when compared to non-COVID RDS? So possibly uh, COVID related uh, neurological dysfunction is even worse because uh, um, as mentioned in the literature, the occurrence of neurological dysfunction in uh, COVID is uh, related to different factors. One is the chronic hypoxemia, which is common with normal ARDS. In my opinion, I think that this is probably one of the major mechanisms which is uh, underlying uh, the mechanism of uh, cerebral complications after ARDS, COVID and non-COVID. And then you, have, you always have to keep in mind that COVID might have a direct effect on the, on the brain. And the more is the effect, the more is the severity of, uh, of a COVID infection. And third, there is also all the issue which is related to the coagulopathy um, in COVID, which is much higher than uh, in the general ARDS population. And this can cause, uh, cerebral, uh, cause ca cerebral thrombosis or cerebral hemorrhage and uh, different uh, uh, complications which are, are related to the coagulopathy. If I take together all the things that you told us, I would say that we should monitor the brain of these patients when they suffer from RDS, even if it's a medical reason. Do you agree with that? 
I would say that we must monitor the brain, not just should. This is very important. I always try to say that uh, um, it's funny because we use a lot of monitoring to assess the function of the heart, of the lung, of all the organs, but sometimes we, we think that the body finishes at the level of the neck. But uh, in the general ICU, it's absolutely worth it that uh, neuromonitoring is applied. Neuromonitoring is not just for neurointensivists, but should be for everybody because there are a lot of complications which can uh, occur even in the generalized ICU population. And we have so many non-invasive neuromonitoring tools like the pupillometer, the EEG, uh, the transcranial Doppler, the NIRS, et cetera, which can be safely used. And with a small amount of training, it's really possible to get important information to early detect several uh, complications and eventually uh, treat aggressively the patient. Uh, if you want just to summarize us briefly, which would be the effect of changing the ventilator setting? For example, I change uh, the PEEP or I try to increase FiO2, I increase the respiratory rate. Which would be the consequences if I monitor the brain on brain function? So uh, all the factors that you mentioned have uh, an effect on the brain. Um, we know, for example, that the CO2 is one of the major components which influence the cerebral blood flow. And we know that the hypercapnia can cause an increase of vasodilation, of cerebral vasodilation. Uh, this is something which is normally allowed in the general ICU population for the concept of a permissive hypercapnia. In brain injured patients, for example, we need to be very careful about using permissive hypercapnia because the cerebral vasodilation can cause increased intracranial pressure. We have published uh, some data last year regarding um, patients uh, ventil mechanically ventilated with COVID and uh, the 30% of them had an increased intracranial pressure during the, uh, during the mechanical ventilation. So first of all, be very careful with the CO2 which should remain in, uh, in normal range uh, if possible. Regarding the ventilatory setting, this is a huge uh, issue because PEEP can be obviously useful because it can improve oxygenation, it could avoid uh, actelectasis, et, et cetera. But at the same time, PEEP can also decrease the outflow in the venous compartment and increase the intrathoracic pressure. Also can have an effect on the cerebral, on the systemic and therefore cerebral hemodynamics. And therefore, it, we should be very, very careful when we, when we set the PIP. In general, I think that the setting of the PIP should rely on the same principles of a general ICU population. So watch the respiratory mechanics, avoid hyperinflation, which, uh, hyperinflation which can cause uh, hypercapnia, avoid hemodynamic instability, and set the PIP at the minimum level at, at which you have the best driving pressure. So if you rely on this, uh, on this concept, uh, you will probably not have uh, many issues in terms of, uh, of the brain. The tidal volume, I think we need to be protective regarding the tidal volume because even in brain injured patients, high tidal volumes are associated uh, with uh, uh, VLE and uh, lung injury. So I think that uh, we need to be very careful to maintain protective plateau pressure even in brain injured patients to avoid uh, uh, cerebral damage. I have a last two question because you mentioned, of course, the basic ventilatory setting, but you have uh, published a few weeks ago, it was again in RDS in COVID, a very nice paper looking at the effect of rescue maneuvers uh, on uh, brain oxygenation and brain function. So my question is how um, these uh, rescue maneuvers that you can also include, of course, ECMO, would the potentially change or influence brain perfusion, brain function, and brain oxygenation? So I think it's a... Uh... We have learned from this uh, paper that uh, it's very important to, uh, to monitor the brain, especially during, during the rescue therapies. Uh, we know that uh, rescue therapies have always been considered a concern in brain injured patients uh, because uh, they are aggressive treatment which can have a detrimental effect on the brain. So in the paper that you mentioned, for example, we evaluated the effect of uh, recruitment maneuvers 
Recruitment maneuvers uh, have the potential to improve the systemic uh, oxygenation, but the issue with uh, recruitment maneuver that we noticed uh, was uh, a, an alteration of uh, hemodynamic stability, so an episode of hypotension. So when you measure contemporarily the cerebral oxygenation and the intracranial pressure, what we saw in this paper is that uh, the cerebral oxygenation was not improved. Actually, it was, uh, it was worsened. So in reality, the use of recruitment maneuver should be a bit more discussed and studied in this population. In the, the use of the prone position, as you can see from the results of that uh, study, um, caused an increase, an improvement of the cerebral oxygenation and an improvement of intracranial pressure. And this was related to the fact that uh, when, you turn, when we turned our patients, the median arterial blood pressure was increased. So probably despite the increase of intrathoracic pressure for the prone position, we, maintain, we were able to maintain a cere an appropriate cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, nitric oxide uh, didn't provide uh, uh, huge hemodynamic issues and therefore from our results it seems to be pretty safe uh, from the brain uh, point of view. And regarding the extracorporeal uh, measures, uh, well, there are really, really few data. Uh, in our paper, we just included the case series regarding carbodioxide removal. I would suggest be careful regarding the velocity with which you reduce the carbon dioxide because um, a too quick reduction of the CO2 can cause uh, a cerebral vasoconstriction with possible cerebral reduction of, uh, of the cerebral oxygenation. We don't have data regarding the ECMO, but we know from the literature that the concept is basically similar because uh, what you need to be careful to in the ECMO patient is uh, uh, how quick you, you correct the target of oxygenation and CO2. If you reduce too quickly uh, the, the CO2, this can cause uh, a number of uh, cerebral complications. And uh, there are also some, uh, some studies which demonstrate an association with hyperoxia after ECMO initiation and uh, cerebral hemorrhage. So just to answer your question, especially during these rescue therapies, we must monitor the brain. <laughs> I, li I like this uh, conclusion because you made the point on the interest of brain monitoring, even in patients who do not have a brain injury at the beginning, who are considered just medical. So I hope that uh, your work and your uh, results could help physicians to have more attention in this very particular issue. Thank you, Chiara, for being with us and hope you to see you soon for the next interview. Thank you very much, Fabio, and hello to everybody.